Do you need answers? Is there a need for a true spiritual and prophetic encounter with God? Join Dr. Candice Smitherman and various relevant prophetic voices from around the world. Become enlightened as we walk down the true road to an authentic spiritual encounter. You will experience the glory of God with Dr. Candice and the Glory Road Show. I titled this today, the Lord gave me this, it's called Tapestry. All right? So if, if you weren't here yesterday or you're not aware, I'm, I was a retired naval officer 22 years. I, I was a naval flight officer that flew the P-3. I had about 2,500 hours of it. I was here in Jacksonville uh, in the early 90s as an instructor. This was the, at that time, it was the largest aviation squadron in our U.S. Navy, and I was one of the instructors there from 1992 to 94. Uh, and so one of the things that you learned, I learned right away. I mean, I grew up on a farm in Wisconsin. I had never flown. It was just something. I wanted to be an astronaut, but I didn't have the aptitude. I didn't do that well in college. And so, but I still wanted to fly. So I went to the Navy recruiters. I took an aviation test that they give you to see if you have the aptitude. And I, I did pretty well in it. And then you got to go through all the rigmarole, all the physical things. And if you ever saw the movie Officer and a Gentleman, that's the program that I went through to get commissioned. And it's a, it's a very interesting program because the drill instructors kind of use a lot of very uh, interesting language uh, that, um, you know, to describe you. Uh, they come up with nicknames for you that are very interesting languages. And so, um, you know, and one of the things that I found out as I got into the program, it takes about two years before you can get your wings of gold. Uh, and, and I found out very quickly that in aviation, they, they, came, they kind of use this term that we push the edge of the envelope. And uh, that phrase means you kind of take risks. Now, mind you, they're calculated risks. They're not just taking risks for risk's sake, okay? Uh, it's not like we're tempting fate or challenging the Lord and, and taking risks, but you kind of just push the edge of where you were before, I guess, is a way to say it. Well, I kind of wanted to say that so that I'm hoping today that you and I will push the edge of the envelope and expand our understanding of who we are. Okay? See, we only live at the level of our identity. If your identity is that you're a less than, you are perfectly happy living there. You're content. But when you get a revelation of who you really are, you are no longer content living that way you used to live. So in one of my tours in the Navy, it was actually, we left here. Candace and I left here. We were, uh, it was was the spring. It was actually late spring, early summer. And I get a call into the office by my commanding officer. And in the office, and now you got to understand, back in 1994, I was quite a hooligan. I, I wasn't a very squared away Christian. I was, a, I was living in the world, and I was wild. In fact, they used to say, my boss used to say, the captain would say, Smitty, my call sign was Smitty, we need you in the air because when you're on the ground, you're in trouble. Okay? And so I get called into the office in July, uh, June, I'm sorry, of 94, and they, I thought I was in trouble. I got pulled off a flight, and I'm going, oh, no, what did I do now? I'm serious. So then I'm walking and the duty officer doesn't know. He's one of my buddies and he's like, I don't know. The captain said, go get get you off this flight. Like I've never been taken off a flight. I've never seen anybody taken off a flight while we're preparing and getting ready. We were doing pre-flight. And so I go, okay, two things have happened. I either did really something really stupid and they found out because I did a lot of stupid things or somebody died that I knew and they were pulling me off to tell me. So I get in there. Not only is my Navy captain in there, my boss, the Commodore of of the whole area is in there now now okay so i'm not i'm not really that stupid and i'm going oh geez what'd i do <laughs> they go they go hey smitty have a seat well that's a good sign because usually they don't let you sit down if you did something wrong so he goes hey um what do you think about iceland and i go uh i don't know you know it's a place uh, i don't know he goes well we want to put you up for the interview for the new admiral that's going there to be his aide and you got to interview for it and i'm like oh So I'm listening, and I'm like, inside, I'm like, oh, gosh, thank God, it's not something bad. But then he's like, okay, so here's the deal. you got to make a decision by tomorrow. And so I said, can I contact my wife? We're five months pregnant. 
At this point, we had had two miscarries, so we're concerned about that process. And, and he goes, absolutely. And here's the number to the aide that's up in Iceland right now. He's expecting your call. You and your wife go talk to him, but you got to tell me tomorrow by close of business because we got to let the admiral know that you're in the running or not for an interview, just for an interview. And so we talked, me and Candace, we decided to do it. I tell him, yeah, I get the interview with the admiral a few weeks later. I interview him with, uh, he was the commanding officer of the Theodore Roosevelt uh, aircraft carrier at the time. I go there, they fly me up to Norfolk, I go for the interview, and he's talking to me for an hour and he doesn't talk to me about anything about me. He talks about, he wants to know about her. Constantly asking me about her. And he goes, finally at one point, he goes, you know I'm not asking you about anything about you? Because I got it all on your record. You're, you're here because you're good enough to be here. The last question he asked me after all the things we're doing, he goes, what shoe size are you? I go, 10. He goes, okay, you want the job? I'm like, yeah. He goes, the reason I asked you for your shoe size is I'm the same size, so if I forget my shoes, I take yours. <laughs> True story, okay? And on our first trip, he forgot his shoes. And his wife chewed them out when we got home for taking mine. Cause, but anyway, so... <laughs> So we, and he says, be here and I'll be in Iceland. I'll meet you in a month. So we had a lot of work to do to get there and get ready and everything. So I'm on this aid tour with Admiral Bryant in 1994 to 96. And on one of our trips, we go to the Netherlands. And I specifically remember this trip to the Netherlands because of the cobblestone streets. And then when we were there, the leadership there took Admiral Bryant and I got to go because I'm his strap hanger. You know, I go everywhere he goes pretty much. And we go 15 minutes away to a small town and they wanted to show us the place, the house where Corey Ten Boom lived. The hiding place, right? You're familiar with her, right? Now, just, just, just in case nobody is familiar, Corey Ten Boom and her family were Christians, and they lived there, and they, their, her father was kind of like a jewelry store, really focusing on watches, and, and what they saw what was happening to the Jewish people, and so in 1940, when the Nazis came in, her father and, and her sisters and brothers, they, they took in Jewish people to protect them and to get them to escape, and they saved in this little room in their second floor, in the wall, in the wall they made this room where six Jews could stay at a time, they were able to get out into safety 800 Jewish people. Now, what happened in 1944 is a Nazi disguised as a Jew tricked the girl who answered the door, who happened to be Corey, and they arrested all of the Ten Boone family that day the Nazis didn't realize, though, that there were six Jews still hiding in the hiding place that 72 hours later still were in there and stayed quiet and were rescued and found safety. But the Ten Boon family got sent to concentration camps and all of them died except for Corey. And it's, a, it's miraculous how Corey survived because she was supposed to be killed but in December of 1944, they had an administrative error and she was released. And so she, of course, the, everybody pretty much knows this. She goes around the world telling everybody about her story and preaching the gospel, right? And it's the book, The Hiding Place. But I don't think a lot of people know something else. What she took with her everywhere she went was a tapestry. Now, if you've ever seen a tapestry, on one side of the tapestry, on the back side, it's pretty, it doesn't have a pattern. It's very musty. It's like a mishmash of loose ends of thread and stuff, no design whatsoever. And if you can picture that in your mind, that describes us, our lives here on earth. It, in the natural realm, that describes us, okay? Now, when you switch over a tapestry, it's this beautiful design. You see a pattern, it makes perfect, it's just gorgeous. And that, folks, is the lens that we need to look through, through God's eternal lens, to understand the backside of the tapestry. Okay? See, God has an ultimate design in what he's doing, and it's only discernible when you and I look at history and life through God's lens from his eternal perspective. For instance, there's no way any one of us can explain the atrocities that have gone on throughout the ages. 
the famines, the plagues, the holocaust, the wars, even death, until you flip over the tapestry and you see God's ultimate plan to weave everything together. And no matter how much, uh, you know, how messed up our lives appear or how chaotic our circumstances are or how devastating it may be to witness atrocities, God alone has the power to intercept our lives and weave our messes into a beautiful tapestry. Yeah. Hallelujah, right? See, that's the power of an infinite God when we submit to him completely. See, if we let him shape our lives and in, and in the process, life, you know, and look through God's lens of our experience from an eternal perspective, you can see a beautiful tapestry. Now, are you with me on this? Are you, are, you, are you okay so far? I think you are. Overall, I think you are. See, we often look at ourselves as a person just getting by. I'm talking about you looking at me. These people right here, you, you all right here, right now. We rarely look at ourselves as this creation that God has produced to deal with the very issues that are going on in our life. We get duped. We don't realize that God has gifted us. He's chosen us. His creation, made in his image, are these creatures struggling and trying to measure up and understand their purpose for life. And it doesn't matter, folks, whether it's the demonic or just life that makes us process that you and I don't have value. See, if you can tell the value of something, you can do that by how? By understanding the price that's paid for it. Right? I think some of you already know where I'm going with this. Some people will pay a lot of money for things that other people are just go, that is stupid. What are you spending that much on that for? Why is that? Right? Because the value of the item is determined by the appraised sacrifice of the person that wants to get it. So you need to ask yourself, if you doubt your value, if you doubt your purpose. What price was paid for you in order for you to be hanging around with God for eternity? Let me remind you that you were not picked up for some scrap heap, some aluminum cans, traded in, or some like material that's over at the Goodwill or the Salvation Army. Now, in the Word of God, it says in Luke chapter 22, verse 20, Jesus is speaking here, and he says, we just went through it, it's called communion, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. In other words, that's not just any blood you were exchanged for. That's God's own blood. See, we tend to take this for granted. I mean, we go through that, but do we really understand what's going on? I, I, just, I just don't think we do. And see, when we really understand that our value is determined for eternity now, right, by God, and that he was willing to pay the price of his life for our life, his blood for our soul. Do you honestly want to continue one moment processing that you're not worthy? God literally became a man to redeem us so we could be taken to the throne room of God. We are born, see, we're born again with the very nature of the unseen God. A whole, guess, you are a whole new order of species is what a Christian really is because of the new birth. You got to be born twice. We're born in the natural, but if you're not born again in the spiritual, we need to talk about that today. See, look at it like this. God created a creature in his own class, in his own image when you're born again. See, God created the born again person and we are a new species and we're welcomed into his presence forever. Folks, when you hear people say, we're children of God, that should be a big thing. Because here's the deal. Everyone is not a child of God, right. right? Unless they are born out of that same seed that is in the Father, the pre God. Yeah. See, for God's, see, God's family is those that are produced out of his seed. 
And then the Holy Spirit comes. We've been talking a lot about the Holy Spirit, right? He comes to reside in us and regenerates us and fills that gap where our dead spirit was. And, the, and this whole born-again process makes us a new species in God's class. Are you getting the revelation of who you really are? Now get this. Can you believe that all through this book called the Bible... God, from the very beginning, has been preparing a people to rule and reign. I like to look at it this way. I look at God as the ultimate coach. Okay? He's preparing us to execute his game plan in the field that we call life. But it doesn't end here, does it? Okay. See, and see... What, what happens for, for God, the, the Father, the Son, and the, and the Spirit is this. God wants a family. The Son wants a bride. And the Holy Spirit wants a temple. Are you getting this? God wants a family. A father wants a family. A son wants a bride. And the Holy Spirit wants a temple. No, you're not. No, you're not. You are the temple. Come on now. See, the history on earth is training for reigning in the age to come. Why? Why? The purpose of our lifetime here, that little dash you see when you go to a gravestone, right? It's, it's a snap of a finger, our life. Flicker of the light switch. That's the, an eternity thinking. That's this period, right? The reason we're here, what we're supposed to be doing, it's an opportunity to practice what you're supposed to be doing with the gifts that God has given you. Yeah. Why? To train us to reign because when you finally get judged by the Father at the end of your life now, you will be positioned in the administration of His kingdom based on your ability to rule here. Yes. Or another way to say it is He positions you according to your faithfulness in your assignment because your faithfulness re reveals your capacity to govern. Wow. Another way to say it is how did you steward what you've been given? God is watching us steward our time. He's watching us steward our talents. He's watching us steward our finances. He's watching us steward our testimony. Right? So we look in the Bible, and we find this guy, Paul, talking to the Corinthian church. And we read that this church is having an argument and they're having a discussion about judging matters in the church, right, in the assembly, such as there are people they, that owe other people money. There's this uh, sexual immorality going on. I mean, these are all normal, common issues that go on today, right? Okay? Okay, so let's, let's, let's read what Paul says. He, he writes them a letter. You know, these are letters. They wrote him a letter. He writes letters back to them. We have First and Second Corinthians. We're missing... For volume three, but, but the, we have the two. We have two of them, right? So Paul basically is saying this in the Corinthian church in this letter. It's summed up like this. Don't you know who you are? You guys are forgetting who you are and acting like fools. Let's follow along if you got your Bibles or your app for the, your Bible app, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Just going to read verses 1 through 3, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 3. We read, does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, Dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? All right, let's break this down. Paul's saying, in other words, if you guys, now he's talking to the Corinthian church, but he's talking to you and I right now. If you guys have a dispute legally, what in the world are you going to the police and the courts in Jacksonville for? Within the congregation, I'm talking. That's what he's talking about. Within, if you're a born-again believer, he says, now, he says, because if you do that, now the whole world can see how dysfunctional you are. Is that the type of testimony you want? That's, how, that's, what, that's what I get when I read this, right? He goes, 
We have a dispute with each other and go to the world to solve our problems? I thought we were the salt and light. I mean, what, what, he's, what he said, what this church is doing, it's a Jerry Springer show. Come on now. Don't you know who you are? And then in verse 2, he says, the saints, that's us, will judge the world. What? But that's what he's saying. Because see, you're only looking at it temporal. You got to look at it eternally. The world will be judged by us. Okay? And if the world is to be judged by us, don't you realize you were to figure out this minor, trivial stuff now? Then the saints will judge angels? Those warring spirits in the celestial places, both for God and against God, shall be submitted to the saints for judging? Well, that's what it says. Are you reading what I'm reading? Folks, all I'm suggesting is this time that we have here, it's like preseason. You know, or I like, base, I like baseball. It's, it, you know, right now, where are they? They're in spring training. They're practicing. Okay? Because it's the teaching, it's the training, it's the practice that we're getting during this brief time here, right? This brief time here, that God uses to determine where he will assign you when this life is over. Let, let me, if you're having trouble with this, that's okay. Let's go to God's words where I can show you. Luke chapter 19, Jesus is speaking this great parable. Luke chapter 19, verses 12 and 15, I'm going to read. This is Jesus speaking, and he said, he says, he's telling this parable. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. All right. So who's the certain nobleman? Jesus goes away get his kingdom and comes back. That's Jesus, right? Then in verse 13, he says, occupy until I come. Well, well, well. Are we doing that? Just be, are we doing that? Heck, not even close. I don't think we're doing a very good job of that and that's really a kind way to say it. I kind of wish one of the drill instructors was here to get our minds right because they'd use some very colorful language that you'd never forget. Yeah. (laughs) I'm going to throw this at you. Why don't we act as Christians like you're at a concert trying to save 10 seats by yourself? You ever had to save seats by yourself? Ever had to do that? Pretty aggressive, aren't you? That's my seat. No, no, no. You'll take off clothing. You'll put it over there. Lay your You'll put purses. And you're like this. You're like, oh, I got all these 10. You got people feel. No, 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 no. That's, that's, that's for me. Oh, oh, no, no, no. That's for me. Right? Right? What happened if you didn't occupy that seat? You lost the seat. Oh, sorry, Bill, you're going to have to stand. You can't sit with us, right? Jesus is saying here that we are to aggressively take a position and don't relinquish it. Then Jesus says in verse 15, he he wants to know how much everyone gained by trading. Apparently, just spitballing here, It appears God expects us to occupy and multiply while he's gone. And remember, he's always preparing. What is he doing as he's away? He's preparing a room for us. And what did he do before he left? He said, I got all the authority, and now I'm delegating it to you. I'm going to send who? The comforter to help you. That's already been done. So we've got all the help we need. And he says, occupy till I come and multiply while I'm gone. See, he's expecting his bride to occupy and multiply while he's gone. He's expecting us to help mankind and bring in more brides. And as we read on, Jesus is teaching that faithfulness with your calling, with your giftings, 
right, translates to a judgment about your productivity with those gifts and callings. Which translates further to an assignment in the kingdom to come that's already here, right, in the ages to come, over what? Over populations, over enterprises, over cities that will multiply in the ages to come. Now, I, I think some of you are having trouble with this, and that's okay. See, where I grew up, this hopefully should help. We had a lot of oak trees in Wisconsin. Now, we have some here, right? And if you can imagine, an, put an, like you just imagine you have an acorn, right? Come from oak trees. You got an acorn in your hand, right? That little acorn. But you know what you're holding in your hand? You're holding a whole big oak tree, Right? Right? But it just hasn't developed yet. Well, in that same way, each one of us start out as little baby Christians with the capacity to, to grow. Right? See, the DNA of the acorn is programmed to produce the oak tree, and, and the DNA of the oak tree is, in, is hidden within the acorn. It's hidden within you, but you've got to... Come on now. Folks, I'm just reminding you that... You are a whole lot more than you think you are, and you better start occupying the way God has called you to occupy. Stop walking around with this synthetic bombardment about your dysfunctional family, right? Your health issues, your financial situation, or whatever is your latest victimhood mentality distraction the world will throw at you. I mean, it's all this. Wah, wah, wah. Folks, that is satanic. That's a satanic realm. Amen. But the moment you step into that place that you and I are children of another dimension, we are a new species. Let's start acting like it. Yeah. The moment you can identify with who you really are, you can start to see that the new species manifests in this world. But what are we waiting for? Are you waiting for somebody else to do it? Are you waiting for Adam to do it? You can do it. Folks, I'm talking about things that touch every area of your life. Every area. There's nothing that's off limits to God. It's all His. Right? right? You got to begin to manifest the authority of the kingdom of God because you and I were called to reign and rule. That's why we're called by God in the Old and the New Testaments. We're a kingdom of kings and priests. A royal priesthood is us. <sighs> have you been blessed by the Glory Road experience? Dr. Candace would love to be able to connect with you, as she does with all of her covenant partners in a special way. This covenant connection is called the Glory Road Community. By joining this connection group, you will be able to be empowered, enlightened, and spiritually coached by Dr. Smithyman in a more personal way. Go to register today at www.gloryroadcommunity.com. You've been watching The Glory Road with Dr. Candace Smitherman. She can be seen all over the world. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, plant a seed in the ground. You can support by going to candacesmitherman.com. Remember, all donations are tax deductible.